turn with me to the book of Philippians and the third chapter. We begin reading there with verse number one. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I might gain Christ. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God, is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. And so, somehow, to attain the resurrection from the dead. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. I recently read about a petition um, where people were asked to sign about eliminating this dangerous substance for the following reasons. One, it caused sweating and vomiting. It is a major component of acid rain. It could cause severe burns to the human body. Accidental inhalation could actually suffocate you. It causes erosion. It decreases the effectiveness of automobile brakes and it has been found in virtually all the tumors of cancer patients. When presented with this petition, 86% of the people signed to eliminate uh, this substance. Uh, some of you may know that the substance we're talking about is actually dihydrogen oxide, uh, most commonly referred to as water. <laughs> So 86% of the people signed the petition because they had facts, and all those facts are true. It is a major component of acid rain. If you inhale it, it will suffocate you. Steam can burn you, and all through each one is actually true. Those facts are true. But yet, those facts do not tell the entire picture. Because we all know that water is pretty safe. In fact, it's necessary for life. And so with partial information, 86% of people said we should ban this without knowing all the facts. Sometimes truth is more than just the list of facts, that it goes deeper, that there's more to it. And so Paul wants to comfort us today with a very, very deep and important truth. You see, in his age, just as in our age today, there are many people who attempt to try to do things so that God will love them, so that God will find them acceptable, so that God will tolerate them, that they can do something to earn God's favor. And so in our passage today, we'll see that Paul himself lists quite a number of reasons why he should gain God's favor. But in the end, will find out or tell us that all those things are rubbish, garbage, trash. The Paul's objective in this chapter is to get us to understand that there's nothing external that can bring us to God, but because of what 
God has given to us. It starts out in the very first verse that we read when it talks about rejoicing. My brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. And rejoicing is a theme that is found throughout the entire book of Philippians. In fact, Paul tells us here that I never get tired of telling you this. I never get tired of telling you this because it's so important. Sometimes we think, ah, oh, I've heard this so many times. But Paul's saying, I can never get tired of reminding you of this great, important truth that we must rejoice in who God is and what God has done, that it is so fundamental to being a Christian, a follower of Christ, to rejoice in who he is, that if we're not rejoicing, it probably indicates that there is some sort of issue going on with us because we need to be rejoicing because, as Paul tells us here, that is a safeguard for our faith. How does it safeguard our faith? Well, we know that as human beings, we allow all kinds of other things to influence us. How we feel about ourselves this particular day, how we think other people feel about us, how we feel about some other people, if we're sick or we're tired, all these things influence our general attitude. But Paul's reminding us that there is a safeguard to all of these external things. That if we're reminded of the joy and what Jesus Christ has done for us, then that and that alone is reason to rejoice. That no matter what is happening externally, that internally inside of us, we remember what God has done for us. And that general joy comes back to us to remember it. Now, that's a difference between happiness and joy. We know that we're not always happy. We don't live in a, a state of constant happiness, that there are factors outside of ourselves that influence us, but that Christian joy is a general attitude towards life, that although there might be moments when we're not happy, beyond that happiness internally, we can rejoice in what Jesus Christ has done for us. An author by the name of Peter O'Brien wrote the following to help illustrate this. This passage is not an admonishment to some sort of superficial cheeriness that closes its eyes to all surrounding circumstance. Rather, it is the positive Christian attitude that finds an outward expression in our lives that realistically takes into account that there are adverse circumstances, that there are trials and pressures in which we are called to pass. But it recognizes that God is still mighty at work, that he works in and through circumstances to fulfill his glorious purposes. And that is what should safeguard our faith that no matter what else happens to us in our lives, that no matter what circumstances happen outside of ourselves, we still have that joy of salvation that comes in knowing Jesus Christ. Then Paul sets for us out in verses 2 through 4 sort of a, a warning about what it is that the world tells us or an expectation that it has that there are external means that human beings seek to gain God's acceptance, that there's something we can do that will make God favor us. And one of the things that was true in Paul's day was that of um, circumcision, that um, that, of course, was a covenant with Abraham. And so um, there were many uh, still at this time who believed that this was still a key, that one must be um, circumcised in order to fulfill the law uh, that had brought forth. But Paul's saying, this isn't really the issue. The, because circumcision was an outward sign. We're talking about our faith in Christ, and that was a sign of that faith. He's saying that there are still issues in every culture, in every place, by which people struggle with today by saying, what must I do that God will find me acceptable? That God will love me, that he will bring me in and be close to that family of God. Maybe if I can do enough good things. Maybe if I can do more good than bad things, then, then God will favor me. Maybe if I'm nice enough, or kind enough, or generous enough. 
then, then God will love me. But that, that is a lie. Because when we get to the point of thinking that there's things we can do to make God love us more than he already does, then we set ourselves up for failure. So many people that I've talked to, they think that they can achieve some sort of degree of perfection if they just keep working on their lives and some sort of behavioral modification and improvement of their lives. That if they continue to do those things, then eventually they so often get upset by those things because they realize they cannot achieve perfection on this earth, and they cannot certainly achieve it in their own right. And so many of those people decide to reject God. They reject God before God has a chance to reject them. And sadly, that is not the truth. God wants to love and to accept us. The message of the church has not always been helped because sometimes we're told in, in churches from very young growing up that, that our faith is a lot about a list of things to do and, and things not to do. Um, and if maybe we, we don't do the things we're not supposed to do and if we do the things we are supposed to do often enough and, and good enough and with enough achievement, then God will love me and accept me. We're not loved and accepted by God because of what we've done. We're loved and accepted by God because of what He did. Thank you. Because of what He did. We are accepted because of what Christ did for us. Paul then moves to talk about his resume, because we call it like a resume of righteousness, that he wants to make a point here. He's not really bragging, but he's saying, I could brag. Really, by the definition of what the Jewish law would require. Let me give you a list of my qualifications that if I were to show you my resume, you would say, yeah, this is a pretty righteous dude. If someone else thinks that they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul's resume. I'm not going to go through each one of those things, but it establishes that in Jewish mindset, Jewish law, Paul's the best of the best. If anyone has deserved and earned the attributes of God's favor based on their conduct, it would be Paul. That he has not wavered, he has not compromised, he has done the things that were consistent with what the Jewish faith would be teach at that time, at least culturally in their understanding of what they thought was the right thing to do. But then the real crux of this passage, the real key point of the thesis here happens in verse 7. When Paul writes to us, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ. That all that stuff that I listed in that resume, that all my attempts, that everything that I was doing is trash, it's garbage, it's nothing. That Paul saw all of his human efforts And he realized it was of no value at all. In fact, uh, the commentators say that uh, this word usually denotes things like table scraps or manure. uh, And some specifically say that most often this word was used in reference to human solid waste. So that really, by some commentators, the best word choice uh, for this might be crap. That Paul looked at all the stuff he did, and it was nothing but a pile of crap. That's all it was. This stuff that he had spent so much time and effort trying to achieve this righteousness, trying to get God to love and accept him, it was nothing. But Paul found something so much better. He found that he didn't have to earn salvation, but it was a gift to him from God that he found the infinite knowledge of knowing 
Christ, of experiencing who Jesus is. That is the heart of Christianity, the deep inner power of knowing Jesus, of experiencing new life by his death and his resurrection, of knowing his power over death and his power to transform us from our old life to a new life. And friends, that's not just in our minds some intellectual agreement with certain principles or ideas. And it's more than just our feeling of a sense of affirmation. But it is a removal of any attempt that we possibly think that we can achieve something to earn God's grace. Grace is a gift. That Paul was realizing that that really a commitment to Christ requires a total buy-in. It is a surrender of the self, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, the things in which I do, every thought I have, the actions of my life are given to God, not so that I earn God's favor, but because I love God. Because he first loved me. An absolute surrender of a relationship based on love and forgiveness and acceptance and purpose and delight. A relationship where God takes us from where we are and he transforms us and he works in us and he moves us to become who he wants us to be. And that's why Paul takes us here to verse 10 when he says that I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection, to participate in his sufferings and to become like him in death. If we know Jesus, then our hearts, our souls, our minds, our bodies should yearn to know him more, to know the power of his resurrection, to know that that resurrection brings with it new life which is what he wants to give all of us as a gift. That he says that we can participate in his suffering, and no one jumps for joy when we get to participate in suffering, but there is so much to learn in suffering that if Jesus suffers, he invites us to come alongside him and to suffer in the intimacy of his suffering so that when we die like him, we will know the power of new life and resurrection. That should be our goal. But we know, friends, that this isn't a new problem. This goes back to the very first human beings who separated themselves from God when we have Adam and Eve. And we we know in that garden when they were talked to and they were asked about um, eating from that forbidden fruit, you know, God said, what are you doing here, Adam? And he's like, well, it's not really my fault, is it, God? I mean, it's kind of this woman's fault, right? And, I mean, I don't want to get real technical here, God, but you kind of made her and put her here, so kind of your fault, isn't it, God? And he's like, hey, 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 Uh, I didn't make the serpent. I didn't have him come talk to me. It's not my fault. See, that's what we so often do. We don't take personal responsibility. We are accountable for our sins. We don't repent and confess and ask for forgiveness. They refuse to do those things. And that's a story that's repeated over and over and over in the Bible. We have some stories where when confronted with sin, people repent, but the vast majority of it, mm -mm, it's uh, this guy's fault over here. Well, I had to because we always have a reason and excuse rather than taking accountability. As Christians, we have to learn to confess our sins, be honest with ourselves, and ask God to help work in our hearts to reveal those things that are outside of his will. We need to admit that we have committed things against God's will. But when we bring them to God, he is always faithful and just to bring us back. We're afraid to tell God. We're afraid to confess. We're afraid to admit because what if God pushes us away? What if God rejects us? He's not going to. When we confess, he brings us back to him. He always is accepting when we honestly confess our sins before him. You see, the thing about God is he doesn't desire to want to stand in judgment. Though he is just. Make no mistake, he is just. 
but he would much rather come beside us in love as we humble ourselves before him. He wants to separate any barriers that exist between us so that we can increase in our intimacy and knowledge of him. But sometimes we put barriers up. I heard about a lady who went to talk to her pastor because she was upset because he talked too much about forgiveness. And she's like, I think you really need to nail some people. I don't think you're mean enough about things. And so he looked at her and he said, well, could it be that maybe, maybe you're struggling with unforgiveness? Maybe that has an effect in your life. And she looked across and she leaned in and she said, there are things that are unforgivable. I don't care what else it says. There are things you don't forgive. What a sad statement about someone who's hardened themselves so much from the very heart and nature of who God is, that God was so small to her that he was incapable of helping transform her heart to find peace and comfort and forgiveness. You see, we have a choice. We can either allow God in and transform our lives, or we can keep pushing him and keeping him at arm's length. Stay as we are, or we can let him in. And when we let God in, he, he gets in our hearts, he gets in our lives, he gets in our mind, and he helps weed out those things that are difficulties for us. See, God didn't come to make our lives miserable. That's not his will. He came to set us free from those false lies of the world. And so, my friends, I ask today, what sort of rubbish and trash and garbage do we have in our own lives? What are we clinging on to that we think, ah, I got this, so God has to love me. He has to accept me because of this. And we're trying so desperately to get that approval when all we have to do is ask, knock, and the door will be open. Seek and ye will find. The sooner we throw away these false ideas in the trash where they belong, the sooner we can grow in a deeper intimacy with who God is. You see, the sooner we can realize that it's not about getting a pat on the back from the people, it's not about how many sermons you sit through or listen to or how many Bible studies you go to or it's not the image that we project to the world. It's about giving our lives totally to God. And when we look at our lives, we realize that apart from God, I don't have any righteousness. I, I don't have any and I never will. And as soon as we realize that fact, as soon as we admit it, understand it, then the greatest miracle happens. As we humble ourselves before God, as we accept that truth, then God looks at us and he demonstrates and shows us our true value to him, of one that he created and loves, that when we give our hearts totally and fully to Jesus Christ, gives it back to us. We think we're losing something, but when we give it to God, we actually gain. Because he gives us such a fulfillment of purpose and meaning and love and the things that fills our lives. That compared to Jesus, nothing else is important. I would hate for anyone to leave here today and all they heard about this is, oh, Jesus wants me to be saved and I don't have to do anything to do it, so cool, I'm good. And now I got a ticket to get out of hell and I'll just sit here at the bus stop until God calls me home. Because that is not the life that God is calling you to. He doesn't want to give you a ticket so that you can take some ride at some point in the future. Instead, he's saying, come with me right now in the present. Because before you get on that bus, yeah, you got the ticket, but there's a lot of stuff I have for you to do. You have a job to do. And our job is to, is to do God's will in this world, to live a life that God is calling us to do, to know who Jesus is and increase in that 
intimacy by seeking him, asking him to reveal more of himself by praying, by reading the Bible, by fellowshipping with other people. To know fully that God loves you. He absolutely adores you. And he wants you to know him more intimately. Do we really want to know Christ? To know the power of his resurrection? Because I would really hate for any of us to one day realize that we have wasted a great degree of our lives, of the time that God has granted and given to us on this earth when we could have been growing in our relationship to God, knowing him more intimately and serving him as he wants us to do. Because that should be our goal, to know Christ and to know the power of his resurrection. Let us pray. God, may we echo the words of Paul who said that I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection, to participate in his suffering, to become like him in death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection of the dead. God, help us. It's time for so many of us to take out some trash. Help us to break our hearts before you. Reveal the places where we're out of line, where we're wrong. Help us to rely on you and to see and admit our need for you. That so many things that we take pride in are, to use the vernacular, nothing but a pile of crap. So God, help us to have the courage to do a little spring cleaning. Come into our hearts, our minds, our lives, change the things that need changed. Help us to know that we need you, that we really, really need you. And God, if there's any people, person here today that doesn't know you as Lord, that your spirit does not allow them truly to have rest until they know the power of Jesus Christ and of his resurrection for their lives. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we'll